Good evening. It's Wednesday, February 16th. The Biden administration says Russia has added as many as 7,000 troops near the Ukrainian border in recent days. Contrary to claims by Russian President Vladimir Putin that troops would be pulled back from the region. NATO Secretary General Jen Stolenberg also says the alliance has not seen any withdrawal of Russian forces. We have uh, heard the signs from Moscow about uh, readiness to continue diplomatic uh, efforts. But so far, uh, we have not uh, seen any de-escalation on the ground. On the contrary, uh, it appears that Russia continues the military build-up. We are ready to sit down and, uh, and discuss with them. Uh, but at the same time, we are prepared for the worst. Scientists warn the U.S. coast could see a century's worth of sea level rise in the next 30 years and predict that major eastern cities could get hit regularly with costly floods even on sunny days. The director of the CDC says she expects to soon update guidance for mask wearing. California's statewide mask requirements end today for most indoor public places Local governments and businesses can keep mask rules if they wish. Police in Canada's capital telling protesting truckers who've paralyzed the city for more than two weeks that it's time to leave. They're handing out tickets, towing rigs, and threatening imminent arrests. President Biden orders the release of Trump White House visitor logs to the House committee investigating the insurrection of January 6th, once more rejecting former President Trump. Trump's claims of executive privilege. And San Francisco residents vote overwhelmingly in a special election to recall three members of the school board for the slow pace of reopening the schools while prioritizing social issues. From Pacifica Radio, KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. A senior Biden administration official said today Russia has added as many as 7,000 troops near the Ukraine border in recent days. Contrary to claims by Russian President Vladimir Putin, the troops would be pulled back from the region. Russia has massed about 150,000 troops east, north, and south of Ukraine, according to Western estimates. Moscow denies it has any plans to invade, and this week announced a pullback of some forces and weapons. While details are scarce and the withdrawal is only partial, the Russian statements have lowered the political temperature following weeks of escalating tensions. NATO Secretary General Jen Stolenberg said the alliance also had not seen any withdrawal of Russian forces, as did multiple European governments. We have uh, heard the signs from Moscow about uh, readiness to continue diplomatic uh, efforts. But so far, uh, we have not uh, seen any de-escalation on the ground. On the contrary, uh, it appears that Russia continues the military build-up. We are ready to sit down and, uh, and discuss with them, uh, but at the same time, we are prepared for the worst. And if uh, Russia once again invades Ukraine, uh, they will pay a high price. Stolenberg is chairing a NATO defense ministers meeting in Brussels. Rosie Burchard reports from Brussels. The two-day meeting of NATO defense ministers takes place in a tense atmosphere amid fears that a Russian invasion of Ukraine could be imminent. On Tuesday, Moscow announced it was moving some troops back from near the Ukrainian border after military exercises. Ahead of the NATO meeting, Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg said there was still time to find a diplomatic solution to the crisis, suggesting there were grounds for cautious optimism, but warning he had not seen any concrete signs of de-escalation. But we will continue to monitor the signs coming from Moscow uh, about uh, a willingness to continue to engage in diplomatic efforts. Moscow denies having any intention of invading Ukraine, but does want Kiev barred from ever joining the NATO Defensive Alliance, something NATO members say they will never agree to.
Rosie Burchard, Brussels. Russia has repeatedly complained that the U.S. and NATO still have not responded satisfactorily in writing to its security concerns. Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharova said today that Russia is in the final phase of preparing its formal response to the West and that after that a schedule of further steps will be developed. Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov once again and asserted that the expansion of NATO eastward and Ukraine's repeated desire to obtain NATO membership is a threat to Russian security and threatens the balance of power in Eastern Europe and imperils the peace there. Europe's so-called open-door policy violates every legal norm and commitment and is turning into an unstoppable expansion of NATO in the East. That is threatening the security of the Russian Federation, and we've informed our interlocutors of the steps we are taking in our dialogue with the United States. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, who had previously named today as the most likely date for a Russian invasion of his country, declared today a day of national unity. Across the country, Ukrainians of all ages waved flags in the streets and from apartment well windows, hundreds unfolded a huge 650-foot flag at Kiev's Olympic Stadium, while another was draped in the center of a shopping mall in the capital. In the government-controlled part of Ukraine's eastern region of Luhansk, where Russian-backed separatists have been fighting Ukrainian troops since 2014, residents stretched another huge flag across the street. A 2015 deal brokered by France and Germany helped end the worst of the fighting in the east, eastern part of Ukraine, but implementation, full implementation of the deal has stalled. The deal, known as the Minsk Agreement, would offer broad self-rule to the separatist territories. A Ukrainian government official said in a television interview today that Zelensky would consider holding a referendum on the Minsk Agreement. Anthony D'Agostino, a Russian specialist and professor of history at San Francisco State University, told Brian Edwards Tickert of the Upfront program that much of the burden of arriving at a peaceful resolution to the Ukrainian crisis rides on the Zelensky government. The Ukrainians could take the view that um, they want to. They're they're perfectly happy to be uh, um, outside of NATO, etc. Um, and uh, or uh, the Ukrainians could uh, find a way to come to terms with Putin. Um, Zelensky uh, came into office, uh, you, know, you know, promising that, uh, and he has uh, t he has turned around. Uh, he has put on the uniform, gone to the front, marched around in the trenches. Uh, acted as if uh, Ukraine was really going to fight World War One style, you know, going to fight, uh, going to fight the Russians, um, arms in hand. Um, and um, I think if it weren't for that, if it weren't for Zelensky's, um, um, I don't want to say a lead on that matter, but if it weren't for Zelensky's position, uh, there wouldn't be much argument for. Um, um, uh, I should say I should say there wouldn't be much argument against Ukraine and Russia coming to terms, um, and I would think that this might be an available option, uh, you know, for for a country that has uh, got to live with a big neighbor, etc. It, it might make sense. He's really been all over the place, though, hasn't he? I mean, half the time he's been kind of throwing cold water on on what's coming out of Washington, saying the U.S. is being alarmist about the prospect of a Russian invasion. That's right. Yeah, he said U.S. talk of war was was unhelpful. So he he went uh, he went diplomatic suddenly. Um, it's it's not uh, it's not easy to understand. Uh, and even in fact, the U.S. position is not easy to understand. You know, they published some documents uh, that were uh, uh, they were published in the Spanish newspaper El País. Uh, documents of the conversations uh, that the United States have, uh, uh, or I, I say they come out of the conversations that the U.S. had with uh, that Biden had with. Um, had with Putin um, in January, and there, in fact, apparently we presented them with a document. If these uh, if these things are uh, uh, genuine, that we presented them with a document that made all kinds of lovely promises, you know, reciprocal uh, commitments. Uh, we said uh, the 
there would be no war to defend Ukraine. Uh, Finland and Sweden would not be invited into NATO. Um, we said that we, we needed a new treaty to replace uh, START. We use these beautiful phrases like uh, indivisibility of security. Uh, that's a great phrase, indivisibility of security. In, in other words, it's not a zero-sum game. Everybody has got to be safe. You know, we and the Russians, you know, NATO and the Russians, everybody's got to feel safe. Um, and that the, the recent NATO deployments uh, in this document, they said they weren't, they weren't permanent uh, and war was not imminent. So it's a, it's a lovely document. And uh, uh, American representative, the U.N. ambassador, uh, uh, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, she said, we're looking for an off ramp. Um, so, you know, that's all very, that's all very encouraging stuff. Um, but, um, uh, Putin has reason to wonder if it's all just a lot of sweet talk. And, um, if that were really the position of the United States, um, you know, and, uh, we were willing to sit down with Putin, you know, over a period of time and try to, um, hammer out some new agreements, particularly an arms control agreement, I would think would be important, try to get the missiles out of the areas that, Join Russia, uh, um, uh, and the Russians would have to get maybe get their missiles out of Kaliningrad Oblast. That is the area around uh, the the town of Kaliningrad, which used to be called Königsberg. Uh, it's a little enclave, and the Russians have have it absolutely loaded up with weapons. Um, maybe they'd have to, you know, make some reductions there, uh, some efforts to reduce to reduce tensions in general. Um, you know that these would um, these would be in order, and I think they'd be just what uh, what Putin needs. The question is whether uh, the U.S. is on the level about this, uh, whether we want to do this. And there are a lot of voices who think this is uh, absolute capitulation, um, and that we have to stand on principle, and that there's such a thing as an open door to NATO. What a mis- misleading idea! An open door to Na- anybody who wants to come into our military alliance and get our nuclear guarantee. Anybody who wants it can have it. That's not the way military alliances work. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, the, the, there's a lot of uh, um, kind of irresponsible talk on, on our side of the thing. And, uh, you know, Putin, Putin has to deal with that. I mean, publicly, the Biden administration hasn't given the Putin government a lot of room to back down gracefully. I mean, all their public messaging is about preparing sanctions, preparing alternative sources uh, for natural gas to Europe, uh, sending weapons to Ukraine, and training both members of the Ukrainian military and training civilians to, to wage a guerrilla combat against an occupying Russian force. I mean, with, without some major change in rhetoric, you're setting up Putin to look weak if he abruptly withdraws. Well, um, you know, if he did withdraw, there'd be an immediate discussion on our side uh, talking about who gets credit for uh, Putin backing down. And, uh, and in fact, uh, we're sort of developing a certain amount of confidence about putting backing down reminds me about the stuff i teach about world war one um you know the russian russians in 1914 were in a situation where the germans had made them back down already twice uh and uh and uh, they had the idea that the Russians will always back down. And the uh, Russians had just been defeated in a big war with, uh, with Japan, you know. Uh, they, they can't stand up to German power. And, uh, you know, so they, they told the Austrians, do anything you want. You have our utmost confidence, you know, uh, you know to, to uh, smash, smash Serbia, you know, the Russia's ally. And that got everybody into World War I. Uh, um, maybe the Russians don't always back down. Uh, and you know, there, there it is today. I mean, it's, it's alarming to see this, uh, to see this playing out in, in, in this way. But there are a lot of voices, I think, in, in the in the Biden administration um, who want to have uh, want to have um, what's the word? Uh, they want to have credit um, uh, for a diplomatic success here, and they have a tremendous opportunity. The only trouble is, some people are going to say it. it it's it's a kind of appeasement on our side. You have to stand up to them. Um, and it's kind of analogous with Jack Kennedy at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. That was a big win. Although, the United States made some concessions uh, in that time. Um, so this is the problem that uh, that 
that that Biden has. And uh, it seems to me it's an enormous opportunity for him politically, uh, you know, because the public, I think, likes the idea of peace. And I don't think the United States is hungry to stand up to Russia on these kind of ephemeral principles, so to speak, um, that we've been citing, you know, like the open door and all of the rest of that. San Francisco State University history professor Anthony D'Agostino, author of the books The Russian Revolution 1917 to 1945 and The Rise of Global Powers, International Politics in the Era of the World Wars, speaking with Brian Edwards Teekert on KPFA's Upfront Morning Program. And you are listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF, Fresno, online, kpfa.org. Rising sea levels linked to climate change are coming faster and harder than expected. That's according to a new report by the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. The report predicts sea levels will rise along the United States coast by up to a foot by the year 2050, with the Gulf Coast especially hard hit. Christopher Martinez reports. Decades of monitoring show that global sea levels have risen an average of 8 inches globally since 1880 and up to a foot in some U.S. cities. A new report by the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, says that was just the beginning as sea level rise accelerates due to climate change. What we're reporting on today is historic. Richard Spinrad is head of NOAA. He calls the 111-page report a wake-up call. One of the most profound statements in this report is that the United States is expected to experience as much sea level rise in 30 years as we saw over the span of the entire last century. The report predicts sea levels along the U.S. coast will rise 10 to 12 inches on average by the year 2050, with amounts varying regionally primarily due to land shifts. Current and future emissions matter, but this will happen no matter what we do about emissions. Spinrad was joined by other experts for a virtual media briefing on the new report. It went smoothly, except for a brief delay as people helped the head of NASA click the unmute button. They described new data and models from the recent 6th Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report that they say helps them close in on likely scenarios. Along with rising sea levels will come another related threat, coastal flooding. Make no mistake, Sea level rise is upon us. Nicole LaBeouf is director of NOAA's National Ocean Service. She says the kind of flooding that now comes during big storms will become even more frequent, even without severe weather like storms and heavy rains. Today's report finds that by 2050, moderate flooding, flooding that typically damages property and commerce, is expected to occur 10 times as often as it does today. What that means is that communities now dealing with nuisance flooding will be facing more damaging floods in just 30 years' time. Another way to think about this is that a single flooding event, one that now happens every four to five years on average in coastal communities in the southeast United States, will occur four to five times per year. The report predicts the largest sea level rise, 16 to 18 inches, will come along the Gulf Coast, home to threatened wetlands as well as an active offshore oil drilling industry. Sea level rise and flooding will not only affect coastal communities, it will also affect the broader economy. LaBeouf notes that supply chains are heavily dependent on functioning ports. The dollar cost of this all will be hard to predict, but the prospect is ominous. What I will say is that the magnitude of these impacts, direct and cascading, will be high. 40% of the U.S. population lives within 60 miles of our coastlines. There will be highly variable impacts along those coastlines, but there's no denying that a large portion of our um, economy and revenue and tax base are right there front and center. 
All this comes amid a complicated swirl of factors like the COVID-19 pandemic and economic instability, and even the prospect of war in Ukraine, with accompanying oil price increases that some say will accelerate a shift to electric vehicles, but others fear will revive oil drilling and fracking in the United States. All told, both the science and the politics of climate change are notoriously hard to predict. But LaBeouf says the new report will help communities plan infrastructure and keep people safe amid rapid and profound change. Now, as delivery of this information today makes it possible for businesses and communities to make informed decisions now, while there are still more options available to us, and before it's too late to protect ourselves from the worst of these impacts. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. The director of the CDC says she expects to soon update guidance for mask wearing. Dr. Rochelle Walensky said hospitalization levels will be a key metric for local communities to consider. We must consider hospital capacity as an additional important barometer. Our hospitals need to be able to take care of people with heart attacks and strokes. Our emergency departments can't be so overwhelmed that patients with emergent issues have to wait in line. We are assessing the most important factors based on where we are in the pandemic and will soon put guidance in place that is relevant and encourages prevention measures when they are most needed to protect public health and our hospitals. We want to give people a break from things like mask wearing when these metrics are better and then have the ability to reach for them again should things worsen. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention continues to recommend mask wearing indoors in public places, even as many states have lifted that mandate. California's statewide requirements ended today for most indoor public places. Local governments and businesses can keep mask rules if they wish. Walensky said the seven-day daily average of new reported COVID cases has decreased by 40% since the previous week week, but it remains high at 147,000. Hospitalizations are down 28% to 9,500 a day. Deaths have also decreased, although by a smaller 9%. U.S. COVID deaths total about 2,200 a day. 11 of the 12 Bay Area counties in the city of Berkeley are lifting their mask mandates for vaccinated people in most indoor public settings as of today. That aligns with the new state rules that went into effect today. Santa Clara, the Bay Area's most populous county, however, will keep its indoor mask requirements in place for now, and so will Los Angeles County. Businesses may choose to keep mask mandates in place. San Francisco says it will require indoor masking for those visiting city hall, libraries, or other city facilities. With a surge in guns being discovered at airport checkpoints, some security experts are suggesting higher fines and even putting violators on a no-fly list to prevent firearms from getting on planes. At a House Transportation Subcommittee hearing, New Jersey Democrat Bonnie Watson Coleman warned of the dangers posed by rising gun seizures and record numbers of disruptive airplane passengers, many of them angry over having to wear a mask. The increase in unruly passenger incidents, alongside the increase in firearms injected into the aviation environment, make for a toxic combination. We need to explore a range of solutions to keep guns off of planes and away from the TSA checkpoints. Airport screeners found nearly 6,000 guns at checkpoints last year, easily breaking a record set in 2019, and that despite a drop in air travel. 86% of the guns were loaded. It's against federal regulation to pack a gun in a carry-on bag. People who are caught are rarely prosecuted, however. They can face civil penalties ranging from $1,500 to about $14,000 in fines. At the hearing yesterday, airport officials and some lawmakers argued for raising the fines. The general manager of Atlanta's main airport said violators should be required to attend gun safety classes. 
However, a Florida Republican on the committee said most people who bring a gun to the airport forgot it was in their carry-on bag and that higher fines would solve the problem. The Coronavirus pandemic and resulting home confinement has caused kids' screen time to soar. Much of it's spent playing video games and using social media. Now, the National Parent and Teachers Association, the PTA, has introduced a smart talk tool to address the issue. Rose Brown has that story. Carrie Neal, the NPTA's Connected Ambassador, says the tool is designed to help parents start a meaningful conversation with their kids and lay out ground rules for being online and using mobile devices. The Smart Talk tool brings that power to families to collaboratively discuss what are we comfortable with, what are the parameters, and gives parents some language to work off of, and it gives kids a voice in the conversation. Neal says PTA Connected is designed to educate and engage families on everything digital, from wellness to security to access, equity, and literacy. She adds parents can go to the website pta.org slash safer internet for guidance on how to facilitate a safe experience when kids use social media or gaming sites. Neil says parents should not wait to address the issue of screen time until their kids are missing in action from family activities or it's causing friction among family members. So really it's just being brave and having that conversation with your child, not avoiding it or waiting until there's a problem or a situation that might result in a consequence. So proactively reaching out and having that discussion is so, so important. She adds the tool encourages parents to explain, for example, who should be considered a stranger online and to make sure kids know not to give out personal information like their address, school, or birth date online. The National PTA site also has links to programs such as Create with Kindness, addressing responsible online behavior, and how to enable parental controls on TikTok. For Texas News Service, I'm Roz Brown. As the nation shifts toward ending the pandemic phase of COVID-19, another health crisis appears to be worsening. A new bipartisan congressional report shows drug overdose deaths surpassed 100,000 last year in one year. The most involve synthetic opioids like fentanyl. Mary Sherman reports. Here in Ohio, fentanyl killed nearly 19,000 people between 2016 and 2021, highest number among states. Linda Sider runs Caracol, a Hamilton County organization that provides what are known as harm reduction supplies to drug users. She says fentanyl can be found in almost every illicit drug now. Not just heroin, even meth and crack. And oftentimes people are unprepared for the fentanyl that whatever they're smoking may be placed with. They are at risk for an overdose. Unlike most other areas, Hamilton County has seen a 34% decrease in opioid-related deaths in the last several months. Sider says the decline is attributed to harm reduction measures, including expanded availability of the anti-overdose medication naloxone, needle exchanges, and public education about overdose prevention. Caracol is home to the first harm reduction vending machine in the Midwest. Sider explains it provides free access 24-7 to supplies that can help prevent disease and overdose. The machine dispenses safe injection kits without syringes. The kits include cookers and tourniquets and Narcan and fentanyl test strips. And then information about treatment resources as well. Cider says abstinence-only education isn't always successful. So harm reduction focuses on building a respectful relationship with the stigmatized group. People who use drugs, they come in the door expecting to be judged. That's their experience. And if you tell people you need to get sober, they may or may not, and many will not. And so how do we keep them as safe as they can be in the meantime? The congressional report calls for a strategy that focuses on shutting down sources of chemicals used to make synthetic opioids. It also recommends fostering development of opioid alternatives, investing in addiction research, and getting treatment and support to people who become addicted. For Ohio News Connection, I'm Mary Sherman. This is the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK, Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. This is an hour-long newscast airing without interruption each night at 6. There is a half-an-hour edition on the weekends. All the newscasts archived online at kpfa.org. They're also available as subscription podcasts. I'm Mark Miracle. 
San Francisco Mayor London Breed said today she will gather a list of school board candidates and begin interviews with them after voters overwhelmingly recalled three members of the city's school board. Breed had backed the recall. She said today that the board must focus on the essentials of delivering a well-run school system above all else and complained about how the board had conducted business during the pandemic. The frustration, the uncertainty, the inconsistent information, the lack of clarity, the bickering, the politics, and who suffered the most? Our children. They suffered the most and they're still suffering. And so we have to put aside all personality conflicts and we have to focus our attention on addressing what is most important, and that is their future. Organizers of the recall had complained about school board priorities. The San Francisco School Board spent time on a process to rename schools honoring public figures linked to racism, colonialism, or sexism, while schools were struggling with how to educate children during the pandemic lockdown. Others were upset over the attempt to diversify the city's elite Lowell High School by changing its admission standards. The San Francisco Teachers Union had opposed the recall. It called on Mayor Breed to appoint pro-public education replacements. Breed said she will talk to the union about filling the vacancies. The union, the United Educators of San Francisco, also pointed to the almost $2 million poured into the recall campaign by billionaires and wealthy venture capitalists. Tim Redman, the founder and editor of the online publication 48 Hills, also pointed to the big money behind the recall. He spoke to KPFA's Cat Brooks on the Upfront program. There was a huge, massive amount of money coming in, much of it from um, the from right wingers who support charter schools and oppose and, and are in favor of privatization of education. And there really wasn't any big money or um, uh, the kind of campaign that would have been necessary to fight that to support the three school board members. There was obviously a lot of frustration with the school board from parents in San Francisco, but this was driven by big money. Tim, you and I have been talking about this a bit. What are the implications in terms of what this means for GOP political sway in San Francisco? Is 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 it here well, to stay? No, I don't think it's. Well, there's. We can. We're seeing the impact of Republican money, and money from people who support Republicans. And um, we've we've been. I mean, we're we're seeing that with the. Um, recall of Chesa Boudin, and we're going to continue to see that. Um, I think what this is going to mean is, I mean, the first thing this is going to mean is a significant increase in the power of the mayor, who will now get to appoint three school board members. And if you look at the board of supervisors, many members of the board of supervisors historically have started off as school board members. Uh, but I think that this has other national implications with the number one efforts to use the recall as a tool to um, win elections that uh, the, the more conservative forces haven't been able to win on a normal election day. And number two, it's part of the, um, you know, Betsy DeVos privatization of public education move. Meanwhile, there will be a runoff in the race to fill the San Francisco assembly seat left vacant when David Chu became city attorney. San Francisco supervisor Matt Haney and former supervisor David Campos will advance to an April runoff, both of them on the progressive end of the political spectrum. San Francisco's unionized city employees are calling on the city to fill some 3,800 vacant full-time city positions. With some of the unions set to begin contract negotiations with the city, workers are saying chronic understaffing is a big problem. Max Pringle has the story. The workers in their unions said Mayor London Breed and other city leaders have left the positions empty for too long, especially given that the city has run budget surpluses in recent years. San Francisco Labor Council Executive Director Kim Tavaglioni spoke to a union rally today in Civic Center. 
community services have been severely underfunded for decades. And the city has nearly 4,000 vacancies among the budgeted positions. That's why we're here today. We're here to tell the mayor it's time to staff up San Francisco and invest in vital public services for all of us. OSHA Ashworth is business representative for the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers Local 6. She says San Francisco can't continue to call itself a world-class city if it allows its city services to go understaffed. Less than 50% staffing in any of our critical infrastructure classifications is simply unacceptable. It strains the workforce, it creates deferred maintenance, and it ends up costing the citizens both time and money. It's time for San Francisco to staff up. Some speakers said that underfunded and understaffed city services disproportionately impact immigrants and communities of color who rely on them more, especially during the pandemic. Susan Kikuchi is with the Chinese Progressive Association. We surveyed over 1,400 workers in the Bay Area, and one of the major things that workers said that they need for a just recovery is the social safety net. It's crucial to address the understaffing crisis because the community members that we serve rely on full and timely city services. Furthermore, our members include city workers and those who aspire to gain stable public sector union jobs. City employee unions say the city currently has a budget surplus of $108 million. For KPFA News, I'm Max Pringle. An escalation in Republican obstruction of executive branch nominees potentially threatens the ability to get any of the Biden administration's vacant positions filled unless Democrats mount a drive to change Senate rules or recess appoint the nominees. The tactic involves Republicans boycotting committee markups, a typically routine procedure in which legislative action gets voted on and nominations get advanced. <clears throat> because of complicated Senate rules, though, this makes it effectively impossible to get nominees a vote on the Senate floor, even if the nominee has the 50 Senate votes necessary to be confirmed. Republican Senator Pat Toomey of Pennsylvania announced that his party would boycott a scheduled markup for five Federal Reserve Board of Governors nominees, including the chair, Jerome Powell, who has been renominated for a second term, and the new vice chair, Lael Brainerd, who currently sits on the board. More from reporter Mary Sherman. Republicans prevented votes on five of Biden's Federal Reserve nominees with the goal of specifically blocking the nomination of Sarah Bloom Raskin. They questioned her past statements expressing support for using financial rules to police climate change. Senate Banking Committee Chair Sherrod Brown blasted all of the 12 Republicans who boycotted the vote. Let me be clear, Ms. Bloom Raskin has been the subject of an unrelenting smear campaign in fear-mongering by the ranking member and Republicans. Despite concerns about his ties to the pharmaceutical industry, the Senate confirmed Robert Califf as the next FDA commissioner, with six Republicans in favor and five Democrats against. I'm Mary Sherman for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. President Biden marked his first year in office with just slightly more than half of his nominees confirmed in the Senate. Biden has nominated 678 people to executive branch positions, judgeships, attorneys, and marshal positions. So far, 356 of them have been confirmed, about 53%. That leaves 322 nominees awaiting Senate confirmation. And Republican Senator Ron Johnson today blocked one of them. The Wisconsin senator's opposition to one of President Biden's nominees surprised Democrats today and presented a fresh test to a tradition that over the years has allowed individual senators to block the confirmation of judges from their home states. William S. Pocan, a trial court judge in Milwaukee County, was scheduled to testify today at his confirmation hearing before the Senate Judiciary Committee. But those plans were scuttled after... Wisconsin Senator Johnson said he could not support Pocan, and he looked forward to working with Biden on finding a suitable replacement. It has been the committee's long-standing practice not to proceed with hearings on district court nominees 
until both home state senators have returned a blue slip that signals the Senate can move forward. The practice is designed to generate consultation between the executive branch and the Senate on judicial nominees. Republicans scaled back that practice for appeal court judges during the presidency of Donald Trump, infuriating Democrats. But they continued the practice for district court judges, The question now is whether Democrats will disregard Senator Johnson's opposition to the Pocan nomination and proceed, a move certain to anger Republicans that would set a new precedent for other district court nominees in the years ahead. Dick Durbin, the Democratic chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, said it was too soon to make that judgment. The White House and Durbin pushed back against Johnson's stated reason for opposing Pocan, who is the brother of Congressman Mark Pocan from Wisconsin. They noted that Johnson, along with Democratic Senator Tammy Baldwin, included William Pocan, a nominee, back in June when listing four candidates they would recommend to serve on the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Wisconsin. In other words... Johnson reneged on his previous support. Johnson indirectly connected Pocan to the horrific attack that occurred in downtown Waukesha, Wisconsin on November 21st when a man drove his SUV through a suburban Christmas parade, killing six people and injuring dozens more. Johnson called that attack the direct result of soft-on-crime low-bail policies and court orders and said he could not support someone for a lifetime appointment who was granted low bail for someone charged with violent felonies. The White House pointed out that Pocan had nothing to do with what happened that day and since 2017 has presided only over court cases involving civil and family matters that do not involve bail. In a subsequent statement, Alexa Henning, a Johnson spokeswoman, acknowledged there was no connection between Pocan and what occurred in the Wisconsin suburb. She pointed to a case a state of Wisconsin versus DeVario D. Washington that Johnson learned about after Pocan's nomination. In that 2015 case, she said Pocan granted a low bail to an individual charged with violent felonies. But then CNN reported that a transcript of that 2015 bail hearing showed that Pocan sided with the prosecutor who was seeking to increase the defendant's bail to $5,000. Pocan has received the American Bar Association's top rating of well-qualified. If confirmed, he would be the first LGBTQ federal judge serving in the Wisconsin-based court. California Governor Gavin Newsom has nominated an appeals court judge who is the daughter of Mexican immigrants as the first Latina to serve on the California Supreme Court. Newsom nominated San Diego appellate justice Patricia Guerrero to fill the vacancy that Justice Mariano Florentino Cuellar left when he stepped down. Guerrero's grandfather came to the United States from the Mexican state of Sonora and got residency through a sponsor. When her father arrived, he initially worked picking crops. Her mother, who recently died from breast cancer, emphasized the importance of reading and education. I didn't get here alone. You know, I stand on the shoulders of my parents and my grandparents who came to this country for greater opportunities for their children. I think it's important for people to see that even if they don't want to be a lawyer or a judge, they can achieve whatever dreams that they want with opportunity and hard Opportunity and hard work, Guerrero said. She has worked as prosecutor, law firm, partner, superior court judge, and currently sits on the 4th District Court of Appeal. She must be confirmed to the California Supreme Court by a three-member panel. Newsom has made diversity on the bench a priority of his. In 2020, he nominated the first openly gay justice, Martin Jenkins, who is the third African-American person to serve on the court.
A showdown appeared to be shaping up in Ottawa's nearly three-week siege by truckers protesting the country's COVID-19 restrictions, as police in the capital warned drivers today to leave immediately or risk arrest. The big rigs parked outside Parliament represented the movement's last stronghold after demonstrators abandoned their sole remaining truck blockade along the U.S. border. With that, all the border crossings were open for the first time in more than two weeks of unrest, centering attention on the Capitol where drivers defiantly ripped up warnings telling them to go home. Authorities in yellow police liaison vests went from rig to rig, knocking on the doors, handing truckers leaflets, informing them that they could be prosecuted, lose their licenses, and see their vehicles seized under Canada's Emergencies Act. Police also began ticketing vehicles. Police delivered a second round of more explicit warnings just before evening tonight, spelling out what charges and penalties could face those who stay. The city's interim police chief indicated officers might move in soon to clear the hundreds of trucks. Reporter William Denislow in Ottawa. Public Safety Minister Marco Mendicino says police will soon create no-go areas in downtown Ottawa and those that violate this will be subject to fines or jail time. He adds that more concrete barriers will be set up and that officials will be more forceful in pressuring private tow truck companies to remove big rigs that are illegally blocking roads. This comes after Prime Minister Justin Trudeau invoked the Emergencies Act on Monday, granting greater powers to authorities in an effort to break up the protests. William Danslow. And you're listening to the Evening News, KPFA Berkeley, KPFK, Los Angeles, KFCF, Fresno, online, kpfa.org. Hey everyone, this is Brian edwards Teeker, And I'm Cad Brooks. Weekday mornings, we host Upfront. Two hours of conversation about what's in the news and what should be. Politics, technology. Prisons, police. What's happening in City Hall and at the State House. In Washington and in the streets. That's starting at 7 a.m. right after Democracy Now! On Upfront. President Joe Biden is ordering the release of Trump White House visitor logs to the House Committee investigating the riot of January 6th, once more rejecting former President Trump's claims of executive privilege. The committee has sought a trove of data from the National Archives, including presidential records that Trump had fought to keep private. The records being released to Congress are visitor logs showing appointment information for individuals who were allowed to enter the White House on the day of the insurrection. In a letter sent earlier this week to the National Archives, White House counsel Dana Remus said Biden had considered Trump's claim that because he was president at the time of the attack on the U.S. Capitol, the records should remain private but decided it was not in the best interest of the United States to do so. She also noted that as a matter of policy, the Biden administration voluntarily discloses such visitor logs on a monthly basis, as did the Obama administration, and that the majority of the entries over which Trump asserted his executive privilege claim would be publicly released under the current policy. The Presidential Records Act mandates that records made by a sitting president and his staff be preserved in the National Archives, and an outgoing president is responsible for turning over documents to the agency when leaving office. Trump tried but failed to withhold White House documents from the House Committee in a dispute that was decided by the Supreme Court. The committee's focused on Trump's actions from January 6th when he waited hours to tell his supporters to stop the violence and leave the Capitol. Investigators are also interested in the organization and financing of a Washington rally the morning of the riot when Trump told supporters to fight like hell. Among the unanswered questions is how close organizers of the rally coordinated with White House officials. Investigators are also seeking communications between the National Archives and Trump's aides about 15 boxes of records that the agency recovered from Trump at his Florida resort and are trying to learn what those boxes contained. 
House Speaker Nancy Pelosi told Israel's parliament that the relationship between the United States and Israel is ironclad. The U.S. remains ironclad, I'll keep using that word, in our support of Israel's security and its regional stability. We're together in the fight against terrorism posed by Iran, both in the region uh, and also its nuclear development. Our delegation is also here to reaffirm America's commitment to just enduring two-state solution, one that embraces, st enhances stability and security for Israel, Palestinians, and their neighbors. The two nations' governments differ over Iran. President Biden has been engaged in negotiations to return the United States to the Iran nuclear deal, from which former President Trump unilaterally withdrew. They also differ over Palestinian statehood. Current Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett has long opposed a two-state solution. Pelosi's visit to Israel came as a second Palestinian teenager was killed in the past week by Israeli forces. The 19-year-old former political prisoner was killed in a confrontation in the Israeli-occupied West Bank. Earlier, a 17-year-old was killed protesting a home demolition in the West Bank. His mother spoke to Al Jazeera. For me, as his mother, no one can feel how I feel now. I love him, thanks to God. I still live with the hope that he will come again and smile at me. His smile was like medicine to me. The Israeli civil rights group Betzalem recorded 77 Palestinian deaths by Israeli forces in the West Bank last year. Police have arrested former Honduran President Juan Orlando Hernandez. It's a step toward fulfilling a request by the United States government for his extradition on drug trafficking and weapons charges. The arrest came shortly after a Honduran judge signed an arrest order less than three weeks after Hernandez left office. Follows years of accusations about the Honduran leader's alleged links to drug traffickers. Federal prosecutors in New York had repeatedly implemented Hernandez as a co-conspirator during his brother's 2019 drug trafficking trial, alleging that his political rise was fueled by drug profits. His brother, Juan Antonio Tony. Hernandez was sentenced to life in prison on drugs and weapons charges in March of last year. According to a report by federal investigators released today, former Trump Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke misused his position to advance a commercial development project that included a microbrewery in his Montana hometown and lied to an agency ethics official about his involvement in the project. The investigation by the Interior Department's Inspector General found that Zinke continued work on the commercial project through a nonprofit foundation in the resort community of Whitefish, even after he committed upon taking office to break his ties with the foundation. The report also said that Zinke gave incorrect and incomplete information to an Interior Department ethics official who confronted him over his involvement and that Zinke ordered Interior Department staff to help him with the project in a misuse of his position. In an effort to curb violence against women in Alaskan native villages, a bill in the U.S. Congress would expand the jurisdiction of tribal courts in the state. Under a pilot program, Alaska would be able to hold criminal trials and sentence anyone convicted of domestic or sexual violence, even non-native offenders. Alaska Public Radio's Washington correspondent Liz Ruskin reports. Michelle Demert, Law and Policy Director at the Alaska Native Women's Resource Center, says perpetrators who prey on women and children are really smart. They know where they can get away with crimes. They've taken advantage of villages for, you know, forever. I mean, this is an issue from first contact where they've known that they can do things with impunity. And, you know, this is our chance to say no more. 
Senator Lisa Murkowski added the Alaska pilot program to a bill that would renew the Violence Against Women Act. The last time VAWA was renewed in 2013, it allowed lower 48 tribes the power to prosecute all cases of domestic violence on their reservations, regardless of the defendant's race or tribal membership. Murkowski remembers how controversial it was. There was a great deal of concern that this was going to change administration of justice it was it was going to be uh they were not going to be courts that were serious it was it was a it was a matter that was very hotly contested and debated now more than two dozen tribes exercise those powers with grants and technical assistance from the justice department murkowski says it works and the predictions of terrible injustice have not come to pass. She says the change the bill makes for Alaska is limited. We're not creating um, Indian country through this. It is, it is just a recognition that in order to provide for a level of safety in our communities, we had to look to some alternatives. But tribal jurisdiction is a little trickier in Alaska. Of Alaska's 229 tribes, only one, Metlakatla, has a reservation. Many of the others have tribal courts that decide child protection and adoption cases, bootlegging, and interpersonal violence. Their power over non-members is limited. The House and Senate versions of the VAWA reauthorization bill would change that for participating tribes. The Senate bill relies on census tract information to define the jurisdiction boundaries, and it leaves it up to the U.S. Justice Department to decide whether a tribe is eligible. Alaska Governor Mike Dunleavy did not take a position on the expansion of tribal criminal jurisdiction when asked about it last week. He said he He's still reviewing the bills, but will ensure, quote, everybody's constitutional rights are protected, unquote. I'm Liz Ruskin. There are reports that Britain's Prince Andrew agreed not to repeat his denial that he raped Virginia Jufri under the terms of their confidential settlement. The Queen's son reached a multi-million pound deal with Jufri to stop her civil lawsuit against him from going to trial. The lawsuit alleged the Duke sexually assaulted Jufri on three occasions when she was a 17-year-old victim of sex trafficking by the late financier Jeffrey Epstein. Prince Andrew denied the allegations. Reporter Ali Barrett has more from London. British media reports Prince Andrew will pay Virginia Dufre more than £12 million as part of their out-of-court settlement. The Duke of York made no admission of liability in the agreement, which ends the civil sexual assault case against him. He had previously said he'd fight to clear his name over allegations of sexual assault that he denied. Prince Andrew's now facing calls to clarify how he is paying the settlement cash. PR consultant Mark Bukowski says he can't see Andrew returning to royal duties. One can see that the royal family has distanced themselves from him and this story, and all his official duties have now been taken away. I don't think this is going to be anywhere near any recovery for Prince Andrew. From Feature Story News in London, I'm Ollie Barrett. An FBI intelligence analyst is going through dozens of text messages and social media posts in which two of the three men convicted of killing black jogger Ahmad Arbery in Georgia repeatedly used racial slurs. FBI agent Amy Vaughn led the jury today through the evidence at the defendant's federal hate crimes trial. Vaughn detailed conversations that Travis McMichael and William Rody Bryan had with other people identified only by their initials. Vaughn said the FBI wasn't able to access Greg McMichael's phone because it was encrypted. The death toll in Brazil from devastating mudslides and floods has swept through a mountainous region of Rio de Janeiro state has reached 44. The mayor of the city of Petropolis said the number of dead could rise. The region was slammed by torrential rains, characteristic of global warming. Sunny skies predicted tomorrow for the San Francisco Bay Area with highs in the low 60s around the bay, the mid-60s further inland. Sunny in the central San Joaquin Valley with a high of 70, highs in the low 70s under sunny skies in Los Angeles. That's it for the news tonight. Thanks for listening. 
In our upcoming Winter Fun Drive, beginning February 22nd, KPFA Storytelling for Social Change will offer you healthy strategies for mind, body, and soul. Free digital gifts we've curated from our archives from great thinkers to protect you from the viruses of injustice and build up your media immune system to keep you and our community healthy. Stay tuned to 94.1 FM for stories on health, healing, and soul coming soon to KPFA. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF 88.1 FM in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide, worldwide, worldwide at kpfa.org. 